for joining. Hello, everyone, and thank you for joining us on today's fourth webinar, Engaging Students, Community Food Systems in Native Communities. Um, I would like to thank you for taking the time out um, and participating with us um, this afternoon. I'm Samantha Benjamin Kirk. I'm Cyril's Farm to School Regional Lead for the Southeast Region, and I'm joined by Gloria and Begay. Hi, Gloria. How are you? I am just fine, thank you. Wonderful, and I look forward to hearing from you. Um, Gloria um, belongs to the Dime, Dime Bitter Water Clan and is a mother and a grandmother. Ms. Gloria earned a B.S. degree in history and an M.A. degree in education administration. As a retired Indian educator, professor, and policy advisor of 42 years, Gloria now advocates and educates for healthier dying people, families, communities, and environments as a current core member of the Dying Community Advocate Alliance, who successfully sought passage of a Healthier Dying Nation Act. Gloria is also a founding Nata Nata Ina Council Member of the Dying of the Dying Food Sovereignty Alliance to restore the traditional foods and cultural systems of the Navajo Nation. Before I turn it over to Gloria, I just want to go over a few housekeeping rules. To make a comment or ask a question, use the chat function that's located on the left-hand corner. This webinar will be recorded and available on our website. In addition to that, you will receive a PDF copy of any slides and attachments um, right after the webinar. And please just take a moment, a few moments, to take our short survey. There's only four questions. Before I turn, before I, I begin with Gloria and we get to hear the exciting things that are going on, I just want to um, provide you a little information that on resources that are available through USDA Office of Community Food Systems. First, we have just published a new school garden fact sheet which provides great examples and best practices of how to engage students um, in communities and classrooms. Um, and, and also, along with that, we also um, provided some additional policy updates on farm to school and school garden expenses and um, a great question and answer um, policy memo that is available on our website as well is the school garden Q&A, the SP 32 2009, which clarifies just how school, how nutrition funding can be used in order to help fund some of those um, projects that engage students in school gardens. We always get questions, um, frequently asked questions, um, concerning um, the use of funding, uh, school funding for school um, garden projects. For instance, can the school food service use funds from nonprofit school food service accounts and purchase seeds from a school garden? And of course they can, yes. With the understanding that garden is used within the context of a program, i.e. selling the food or providing food in the classroom as a part of educational lesson. Another question that we tend to get a lot, can the school food service use funds from the nonprofit school food service account to purchase items for the school garden such as fertilizer, water cans, rakes, etc.? And the answer is yes. As long as the items are used for the purpose of starting and maintaining a garden. Another question that we tend to get a lot is, can a school sell food grown in their school garden that was funded using the nonprofit school food service account? And the answer again is yes. As long as the revenue from the sale of the food occurs back into the nonprofit school food service account. Schools can serve the produce as a part of a reimbursable meal or sell it. 
a la carte or to parents or at PTAs. It's a great way of engaging students in um, in the whole process of knowing know your farmer, know your food, know where your food comes from, and then actually serving it to them in the cafeteria. Another great resource that was recently released is our Farm to Summer fact sheet, along with some guidance that um, came with that, the local foods and related activities and summer meal programs. The SPO 72016 provides guidance on incorporating local foods and nutritional and agricultural-based activities into summer meal programs. That's a great way of keeping the kids engaged, even in the summertime, in local food systems. Um, so now, with no further ado, I'm going to turn it over to Gloria. Thank you very much, Samantha, for allowing me this opportunity to maybe share some um, ideas and activities that are going on in some native um, school gardens and projects. And of course, I'm a Navajo, and I um, have been working very diligently here for the past um, five years, really focusing on um, health nutrition and then now moving into the restoration of um, getting better foods into our uh, native homes. And so you see me in this slide, I'm at a Navajo Congress uh, rancher and farmer conference and I have an exhibit table where, you know, I'm promoting um, different resources and that's what I'm doing a lot of volunteer work um, of course, out here on Navajo Nation. And so um, what I do is also diabetes prevention lessons in um, local school programs. And so that's always fun to work directly with students on um, health and education nutrition and then connecting them with the resources for schools to set up their own school gardens. One of the uh, first lessons that you know we cover um, here beginning to work with our students is ask the question, you know, why should we uh, look at traditional native foods? And this is um, a painting that is done by one of our uh, Navajo uh, traditional practitioners. And so I usually have the students analyze this picture and we discuss, you know, what is this picture trying to tell us? And of course, there's the a uh, man or it could be a woman in the middle of the picture with a corn stalk kind of like in the middle of the body. And um, the important message in this painting is that, you know, we as human beings, you know, have to have food and water for um, continuing, you know, our lives. And so um, corn, of course, is a very um, important and also sacred um, traditional food among native communities. And so this man is outreaching out to the universe. You see the spirals, um, you know, swirling around. And those aren't lollipops, <laughs> but actually those are representing unseen energies in the universe. And those are like, you know, light waves, sound waves. Um, it, for, dish, for traditional people, it, it's our prayer waves communicating out to the universe. You'll see our secret mountains, um, and those just represent our boundaries of our land and what we're used to in terms of um, the land environment. Um, we know what we can plant there, our soil composition, our watersheds. So, you know, the land is very important. And, of course, the man standing on Mother Earth, you'll see the root system there. Um, it just signifies, you know, that from Mother Earth, you know, all life um, begins and then of course Father Sky with the sun, the energy. Um, we go into the scientific lessons of um, photosynthesis and how plants can grow with sun rays and sunlight energy. So all of this um, information is gathered by the students, you know, in discussions. And the important message is that everything in our universe is connected. And by Navajo tribal law. Um, we call it the fundamental laws of Navajo. Um, it tells the Navajo people our responsibility is that we must keep healthy so that we are uh, the caretakers 
of um, this beautiful Mother Earth and Father Sky universe. So by tribal law, you know, we have to be uh, caretakers of ourselves and our land. So that's the important lesson to define that health is happy people, communities, and environment. But anytime there's a break in any of um, these activities in this um, picture, like, for instance, um, if we get sick, um, this shows that, you know, we're disconnected with some unhealthy element in our body system or we ate something bad, and that breaks, you know, um, the healing. Uh, well, it brings back into the uh, work of healing ourselves or if there's air pollution or um, earthquakes, that's a break in our um, Mother Earth, and we need to start helping to heal that. Um, so anyway, all of these elements in this universal picture tells us that everything has to be healthy, and we are responsible to take care of it all. So it's a holistic definition of health in the Native world. Uh, moving on to um, our next slide, um, the next lesson the children learn is that, you know, there's um, a history to um, how we have been existing, you know, um, on our Indian lands. And so um, I know here out on Navajo, uh, there's, um, of course, the issues of um, some challenges that we face with federal and even our own tribal um, policies that, you know, affect our native food system, the way we grow our food, the way we eat our food, and so on. And it began with uh, federal policies like the Skirt, uh, Scorch Earth Campaign. And this is where um, uh, the federal military came in. They destroyed our um, orchards and cornfields. Um, even out to um, Sioux country, they killed off buffalo and um, the buffalo was, you know, their livelihood, their uh, food, their, um, you know, the way they clothed themselves, their homes they made. So, you know, all of these um, um, livestock and our plants and animals were very, very important to us, very much a part of us. And so when that got destroyed, we were no longer in control as Native people. And then, of course, that was the uh, federal campaign to come in and overtake, you know, the Indian people and their lands. And so there's that whole historical um, perspective that our children should learn and understand um, about our traditional food system. Then when the Navajos were uh, sent to Fort Sumner, New Mexico, that was the first experience in 1864 that we started getting um, uh, food rations like flour and coffee and um, pork and some of these foreign foods that we were not used to. So then that began a system of foreign foods into um, our um, Indian country. And other tribes have gone on their long walks. They were displaced off their traditional land. So, you know, that caused um, historical trauma and that impacts, you know, even today uh, through generations of hardships and and memories of um, the tragedies that our Indian people had faced. Then in um, the school systems, um, the boarding schools came into effect, you know, in the late 1800s, and the philosophy was kill the Indian, save the man. In other words, they were taking away the native cultures and languages, and then also the foods and some of the health practices. Then um, into the new century of the 1900s, stores started coming in into Indian country. Trading posts came in, brought in more foreign food, uh, foreign Western ideology. And then currently now we have supplemental food programs like SNAP and WIC. And, of course, that promotes more um, foreign food, as I'm calling it. <laughs> and um, the biggest impact for our Native communities is a cultural shift because of Western education on many uh, Indian reservations, and then also um, economic ventures as um, coal mining, um, and then even fracking for more oil, and um, the, use, the use of um, our Indian waters and stuff. So, you know, these all impact like our environment and our ability to grow our own food. 
Um, out here on Navajo, they're saying 70% of our farms and ranches are in laying in idle because of climate change and water droughts. And then, of course, the impact of all these foreign um, mining ventures. So all of this, you know, our children should be aware of and learn and discuss and how can they participate in their education system to um, work on careers that they can help come back and really rebuild their communities as maybe hydrologists, as scientists, and so on like that, even farming and ranching. So the whole history of um, our Indian people needs to be realized by our Native children. And then this is just a quick map of um, thousands of miles that the Navajo people walked to um, their first encampment at Fort Sumner. And then the next slide here is our Navajo reservation was this small plot of land um, around the border of Arizona and New Mexico, but now um, it has expanded through executive orders to um, our largest reservation area, which is in this next slide. And this one demonstrates that all the pink areas are the Navajo Reservation in Utah, Arizona, and New Mexico. And uh, according to um, USDA, all of our communities are food deserts. So we have a lot of work to um, change that picture through um, school gardens, um, farming, and ranching. Um, our next slide, of course, we all know the story of how uh, bad food, um, snacks, and chips that are full of salt and um, sugars are impacting, causing obesity and high rates of type 2 diabetes. And this is really troublesome in many Native communities. Um, also, the um, um, soda pop, sweet beverages, but I want everyone to know that Navajo Nation, of course, passed their um, um, healthy um, food tax, and um, to date, um, I'm working on the last set of policies to distribute um, revenues from these 2% tax to our Navajo communities for wellness projects. And this could go in, uh, to uh, community and school gardens. Um, to date, we have uh, near a million dollars collected in these 2% um, sales tax on junk food. Uh, in our next slide, when you start working with school programs, of course, um, you can do a, uh, what we call the pre-testing uh, using a KWL chart all the way from kindergarten on up to high school. And you can ask the question, what is indigenous or traditional food? And step one is, what do the kids know about it? And then step two, what do they want to know about traditional foods? And then um, the biggest question is, you know, where does your milk come from? Where does your bread come from? And, of course, a lot of them will say from the store. And little is there knowledge that, you know, these um, foods, you know, come from other sources besides the store. Where do they really originate? And then after lessons, they can say, well, this is what I learned on step three. So this is just a, a, a nifty beginning assessment chart to get the conversation started with classrooms or maybe even, you know, um, a school-wide uh, parent meeting to promote um, um, health nutrition and encouragement, maybe a school gardens. Um, some of our um, materials Here's a nice um, traditional food model. This comes out of the um, Diabetes Education and Tribal Schools curriculum. It's free if you connect to ihs.gov and link on to um, the DETS curriculum. And you can get um, 56 lessons from uh, pre-K to 12th grade. And um, the next slide will show you a listing, a nice listing of current Native American foods all the way from cranberries, wild game, um, sunflowers, wild rice, um, sweet potatoes, um, tomatoes. All of these are traditional Native American foods that our children should appreciate and maybe help get restored back on their reservations. Um, here is um, a listing more of the Navajo foods that is going on on Navajo Nation. 
And this particular list was done, gee, almost like 15, 20 years ago. And it's nice to know that um, there's a whole listing of like corn and wheat groups here, um, plants and berry groups here, um, protein groups, you know, from um, maybe um, plants and animals, and then milk substitutes. And um, if you take a really more closer look at this list, you're going to see fry bread on the list. And I want you to know that this fry bread, of course, is not a traditional native indigenous food. Remember, it comes from flour and um, ingredients that were brought into Indian country more than 100 years ago. And so, um, you know, this listing is um, a really good start for our children to learn, you know, about our traditional foods that um, are grown within our area of um, our Navajo land and other tribes I know are doing also studies to find out what their traditional foods are. I've seen some beautiful books um, from Alaska and from some of the eastern um, northeast tribes on their traditional food restoration projects and our students should start learning all of these in um, their school programs. Um, also I know on Navajo our special diabetes program has even made a book on the terminology of traditional and contemporary foods on Navajo. So um, if you listen to the CD, look at the booklet, you can learn um, how to pronounce the Navajo traditional uh, names of our foods and also contemporary foods that were recently brought in. So, you know, look into your tribal governments, your tribal uh, food programs for um, many different kind of materials um, that the students can learn maybe in the classrooms. On my next slide, um, there's the uh, why should we do traditional indigenous foods? Because of course they're healthy. And so there's special preparations of um, our native soils and native seeds um, using our ancient values and songs. Um, uh, there's planting processes and practices that were done generations ago. Um, there's no chemicals or preservatives, um, you know, in traditional um, food growing. Um, and then we celebrate the planting, harvesting, um, consumption of these wonderful foods. So um, it's very healthy for our mind, bodies, and spirits to learn um, about being healthy and having healthy foods. I want to go ahead and maybe show uh, some quick slides about um, a community out in Pinon, Arizona area with our um, Black Mesa Water Coalition. You'll see some students out here um, in the corn uh, harvesting um, practice. And of course, this is happening in the uh, fall month of the um, school year. And these students are out um, you know, um, in the cornfields picking uh, corn from um, the corn uh, harvest. And um, so these students are busy working either as after school programs or maybe on weekend projects. Another uh, slide here showing the students um, taking the, the uh, corn, pulling back the ears and lining them on um, kind of like a clothesline and those corns are drying for preservation purposes. Um, and so then the next slide, we have here um, the students um, taking down those dried corns and husking them. And they're going to either prepare them for um, maybe cooking or for um, taking the uh, corn kernels off the cobs, preservation of food for the winter months. The next slide here is where the students are doing a traditional um, kind of like corn shucking. They're taking, um, you can see the corn seeds or the kernels um, on the um, cloth and they're traditionally um, pushing two corns against each other and the kernels pop off. And then they bag those and um, store those for winter or they may be um, cooked for um, corn stew. Here, um, some children are taking fresh corn kernels 
and they're putting them in a corn grinder and they're making either uh, corn mush or the, they're going to make another dish of uh, what we call kneel down bread. And so that um, corn mush uh, pudding is put into the leaves of the corn. And um, then they're put on a cookie sheet. Um, and then um, they're getting ready to be put in either the oven or in traditional ways they're put in an oven, excuse me, um, an oven um, that is a traditional oven of um, coals and so on like that. So sheets of those um, kneel down breads are put there to cook, and it's almost like a what I call an instant uh, microwave because <laughs> it does cook fast. Or the other traditional method of cooking is digging um, a big hole, and um, you'll see these students are digging the the big hole to um, put um, coals inside the um, into the ground, and then. Um, they're going to line the ground, the bottom of this ground, with coals. And they're going to um, let those coals cook um, all day. And then at night, they're going to put, lay those um, kneel down brick pieces um, on top of those coals to cook overnight. And we also do our traditional uh, girls' puberty ceremony um, take into the ground for a traditional method of cooking in the ground. And I've seen this done with other tribes. Um, back in the Wampanoag country, they do this in the summer for um, with seaweeds and cooking um, uh, lobsters and corn on the cobs and so on. So different tribes have different methods. Here the students, um, um, you can see all the big trays of all the dried foods, um, the blue corn, white corn, yellow corn. And of course, those will be bagged up and either saved or um, sometimes the students, you know, sell this at um, the local farmer markets or flea markets in the area. Here is um, where the adults and trainers in the community are meeting, um, getting training on on site at the farm on how to help the children learn about the lessons, the stories, and um, you know, practicing those um, growing um, types of stages of um, planting and harvesting, so on like that, and also celebration. Here is another um, uh, workshop that is um, being done by one of our local um, traditional medicine men. Um, our our good friend Phil Blue House is um, training some of our um, adults that work with the children on um, traditional songs and prayers. And so he's doing an intergeneration of training of youth and elders um, to train them, to train our youth on how to do our prayers properly, um, sing some of the songs, how to do traditional practices of um, planting, and so on like that. So. Our medicine people are very valuable, and for schools to promote the youth to have the elders come in and do the training is really paramount in um, school garden and traditional food growing. Um, th this young lady is um, Tonita, and she herself is a Mexican um, healer, and what she does is she goes to school programs or conducts college workshops or summer um, seminars on how traditional foods can be used as um, medicine or how to appreciate um, traditional foods that make you healthy and strong and um, practicing, you know, good spirituality and um, also spiritual songs and so on. So she's out in Albuquerque, New Mexico. And I have her listed as one of our wonderful resources. I was recently at the Tsuki Pueblo at a native um, seed uh, planting workshop, and she did a beautiful um, two-hour workshop and brought in all of her different traditional foods and showed how each of these can be used for being healthy um, for our mind and our spirits and our bodies.
So Tamita is a, a very special um, workshop presenter, and different tribes have these medicine women that can train um, the community people and the children about respecting and also the use of herbs and plants and different traditional foods to stay healthy. So I really appreciate and love this lady for her work. Um, uh, some of our indigenous cultural strategies, of course, uh, use the elders at your uh, local communities, maybe contact them at the senior centers. Uh, partner, of course, with uh, Native leaders so that maybe um, they can help um, promote and push for resources, maybe revenues for um, communities to do school gardens um, or bring in some of the um, traditional people to do workshops. Um, of course, Native language is very key in preservation of our culture and our languages um, speak to um, traditional knowledge of our prayers and songs um, that is so important for our children to understand um, and respect, you know, traditional knowledge of, um, of our um, health practices. Then, of course, um, practicing songs and rituals for seed gathering, seed preservation, um, how to plant them in traditional perspectives, all the way doing the different stages of planning, harvesting, feast days. And if um, school programs can, you know, um, look at the growing season calendar, that's the way they can set up their curriculum. Like springtime, they should start getting the students ready to, for planting and harvest, uh, excuse me, just for planting um, seeds and getting the soil prepared and so on. In the summertime, teaching how to take care of their gardens, and then in the fall time, how to uh, harvest and preserve those, um, those foods. Cosmology values and knowledge. I know um, different tribes um, have different ways they use um, our universe. And I'm going to show the next slide um, in um, Navajo country. Um, this is just kind of an illustration of um, the different um, um, cultural elements that support, you know, us Navajos to remind us that this one here in our Navajo sand painting is um, Father Sky here. You'll see the morn, horn moon here. This is Mother Earth. You can see the plants and the corn stalks and tobacco are um, four sacred foods. And their um, connection here between their two mouths just shows that the two of them have to work together to um, regenerate and cause life to happen. And so this is just kind of like one of our cultural elements of sand paintings that uh, remind us in ceremonies and prayers to respect, you know, the whole universe. And so, in, you know, the, the practice and the knowledge of um, cosmology is um, very important. And I know I do this in my Navajo astronomy classes with the students. And um, so it's just very important that the students get um, access to any and all information of the cultural knowledge of um, the native concept of the universe. Um, the next slide is just um, a little lesson that we teach in terms of Navajo, fa Navajo phases of the moon. And we use the moon as um, weather predictions and different um, other indicators of how and when maybe we should plant and harvest, expect rain, and so on. So there's cosmology again. Um, another element in cosmology is um, constellations. Um, for Navajo constellations, um, this is what we call Del Yeha. And when we see her in the night skies, um, we know it's um, either a time for planting or not planting. And of course, um, these are the seven stars that show the Greek um, Pleiades constellations. So when the children learn these, they, they understand the importance and respect of the night sky. Um, the rabbit, for instance, is another indicator of when we can hunt and when we cannot hunt when we see the rabbit tracks in the night skies. So cosmology really plays a, an important key in our children's knowledge of um, the universe and 
the impact on planting and harvesting. Therefore, we're very um, much um, promoting school gardens in school programs. And um, there are some schools out here um, that I um, know of out here on Navajo Nation, and I know different tribes are implementing school gardens. Of course, my favorite and famous is um, the Star School that Dr. Mark Sorensen presented a webinar a few weeks ago, and his students, you know, have a wonderful school garden. And um, we need to understand, though, that school gardens, you know, take a lot of effort, take a lot of uh, planning and organizing. So, um, you know, work with your local um, continuing education, ag services, um, USDA services. There's all kinds of different resources out there that can help schools get school gardens going. Um, some other schools like Window Rock High School, um, they are doing a school garden. They are also tied with um, another um, nonprofit organization out of Gallup, New Mexico. And these students are developing PowerPoints, um, researching all the um, health nutrition of food, the food system history, um, all of that knowledge. These high school kids are getting ready to go out to our Navajo communities and start training our people about um, uh, good food, good nutrition, and so on like that. So these folks are doing this from a high school level. There's five high schools um, in that particular uh, grant program. Um, our little elementary program, the David Ski Elementary in New Mexico, and also our new deep um, charter school in Navajo, New Mexico. Um, this uh, Navajo, New Mexico organization, our charter school, is a sixth and seventh grade agricultural program. It just started this year, and we're just very excited about them um, teaching the kids about uh, farming and ranching. We have a lot of helpers. Uh, look at your tribal agriculture departments, your tribal colleges, um, and look at even other outside resources. Like I know here on Navajo, we use the National Wildlife uh, Federation services, and many other programs out there are accessible. So it's just a matter of getting out there, researching, look at your telephone books, your tribal directories, and see who can help get your school gardens going, and invite the elders. They have all the cultural knowledge um, that is really possible for um, students to um, access traditional knowledge and enjoy the many songs and prayers and celebration of feast days. Those happen a lot here in the Mexico area with um, um, the pueblos, and they're so enjoyable. And they just serve all the wonderful different traditional foods. And here on Navajo, of course, we do our ceremonies and um, in different times of the seasons and enjoy our traditional foods. And they're becoming a rarity, uh, sad to say. So we're just encouraging our youth to get back in there, restore your um, farms and ranches on your reservations or pueblos, and help um, get traditional foods back into your communities. And, you know, we guarantee that the, those traditional foods are going to be healthy. Um, they're in our gene pools from generations back. So um, this is what made us survive, you know, um, all the different challenges to our history. So, you know, we're always encouraging um, this history and traditional knowledge among our Native youth. The last slide here um, is contact information um, for myself. And I'm retired, so I do this fun work uh, full time. And I go out and I go to conferences and then share resources with um, our Navajo communities. And this last um, notice I want everyone to know is that um, our Navajo Nation, you know, passed the um, quote unquote Navajo junk food tax. And to date, we have generated a million dollars and so we'll be uh, working with our chapter communities on um, distributing that money. And some of that money can go for school gardens. It can go for um, biking, walking trails, all the way to um, health education 
and um, getting clean water, maybe collecting um, trash, making your environment cleaner and better. So, you know, we're excited about that new venture here um, as another resource on Navajo Nation. My friend, uh, Wilmore Blue House, a medicine man, um, is doing our songs and prayers. Conita, of course, um, with Buddhist medicine. And then Roberto Nut Lewis with our Black Mesa Water Coalition working with um, students um, on the whole traditional um, harvesting practice. So, um, wow, that's my Gloria. <laughs> that was wonderful. <laughs> and we're right at 3.45, and I know the webinar was scheduled to end at 345, but we do have four questions in the queue. I just want to be mindful of people um, of your time, um, but um, we, we we want to answer these questions, so we're going to go ahead um, and um, answer the, the questions in the queue. If, if we're not able to get to your questions and you have a question and we don't get to it, please know that we will send you a response back. But, Gloria, you gave us a wealth of information. <laughs> so mm-hmm. Melissa had a question. She um, wanted to know, are there any statistics showing improvements based on the Navajo junk food tax? Well, you see, um, it, took, okay, it took us five years just to push the legislation through the Navajo Council. So um, this um, past year, we've worked on the last set of policies of revenue distribution and helping the chapters um, set up their wellness projects. So we don't have a data on it yet. Um, The monies are available to get to our communities, but we have not uh, measured. We don't have, you know, time to measure when we haven't um, given out the money for those wellness projects yet. So um, give us another year. We're going to be doing workshops with the chapters on how to spend their money and develop those projects. So um, mm-hmm. in another year, we'll have some data. Okay, But wonderful. I do want to uh, maybe – okay, go ahead. Okay. So we had another question from Madison, and her question was um, – she wanted to know what is the approximate cost of hosting a workshop in your community – um, you spoke about um, several workshops that you hosted, engaging the elder and the youth. Um, she wanted to know if there was a cost associated with it approximately. Okay. Um, sometimes, you know, depending on the organization, and we have many nonprofits now that are going into communities, and um, they're not charging. You know, they're, they're there to um, provide the funds to the trainers, provide maybe the ingredients and materials for their workshops. So um, I, I would say the majority of these workshops um, are, you know, pretty much um, maybe free, excepting maybe if you need to travel there or if there's overnight lodging. Like I went to that Tsuki Pueblo seed gathering or seed um, uh, restoration project, and it was a two-dayer, but uh, Tonita got me a um, a tribal hotel room um, overnight, and I had to catch a ride, catch a train. <laughs> um, but those were more my expenses. But the beauty of the contacts and the information was valuable, and I didn't have to pay any of um, the conference fees. Um, I do uh, notice, though. Go ahead. No. No, go ahead, finish. I just can say now there are some organizations that will charge anywhere maybe between I'd say twenty five dollars, maybe up to a hundred dollars for some of these workshops. Okay. I got another you question know, from the- from Darnell. And he wanted to know he wanted some suggestions or examples of summertime garden work um, when most schools are not in session, you know, how to encourage students to participate in the summertime. Okay. Um, Sometimes um, some schools will have their um, school curriculum, like the Star School. They are a year-around school program. So they actually um, have summer session and the kids continue you know, their school garden uh, program of taking care of their gardens, hoeing, you know, um, watering. 
and that kind of thing. So um, some schools, you know, that would be maybe the greatest um, <laughs> suggestion is to have maybe like a year-round school where um, the kids get to participate in the whole um, process of the the planting, um, taking care of the garden, the harvesting, um, right. and preservation. And and I would that like would to just add, right. And I would just like to add is if you're looking for ways to engage students in the summertime, a, a great resource is, is maybe if you have a summer program. You know, having a summer program and then having the activities geared around um, agriculture or school gardens as one of those activities, or even a garden camp would be another way of re- engaging the students in the summertime. Another right, and I know some tribes have, um, you know, tribal agriculture programs. Mm-hmm. Or I know here on Navajo we even have equine um, summer programs, and so um, hopefully tribal um, programs will have special summer camps and gardening and so on like that. So maybe mm-hmm. work with tribal governments. Okay. We're going to take this last question from Chris, and he his question is, how would you approach a school? How do you get the schools on board with the farm to school activities? Um, I would go ahead and um, you can maybe uh, work. A lot of um, tribes have um, what they call Indian parent committees, um, you know, with tied with the school program. And those are Indian education supplemental programs like JOM or Indian ed monies and so on like that. And these Indian um, parent committees, you can approach them, get on their agenda, um, maybe do a presentation on what you see as the benefits and let them go to the school, like um, school board meetings or approach the administration on starting a school garden. Exactly. And if there's any more questions, feel free to type them in. We will um, make sure that we send you an email with our questions. At this time, I would just like to thank you, Gloria, for your presentation. It was wonderful. It was delightful. It was educational. Um, I learned a lot about the Navajo people and some of the traditional ways in which they're incorporating cultural education um, with local food systems, and that's wonderful, teaching our students where their food comes from and and how to grow it and how to to survive. Um, At this time, this ends our webinar. I would like to Thank everyone for your participation. Please, please um, uh, take this quick survey. It's just four questions, um, letting us know uh, other topics that you would like us to engage into in this space. And thank you, Gloria. Yes, thank you.